Hello. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, who, Hi, Colin. Hi. Nice to see you. Nice to see you as uh, well. So we have uh, people joining. Sounds great. I'll just mute myself. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, I think let's give maybe a couple of minutes for people to catch up. Uh, I think it's still they are coming. It's okay. I think a few minutes if we wait, right? Should okay. I start sharing my screen? Uh, yeah, it will be good. Uh, uh, let me see whether uh, are you allowed to. Okay, let me see all panelists. Oh, panelists. Okay, maybe, yeah, you can try and see. All right, so maybe in a few minutes, we, uh, I'll give you an introduction and uh, we set to go. Sounds good. Can you see my screen though? Oh yeah, yeah, uh, perfect. Uh, perfect. You, do you have any movies? I do have some movies. Um, okay, let's see how it works out. Most likely, I think. <laughs> I hope oh, it I see. Sure. Um, let's see. I think it should work, but let me try. This. I think if, if it doesn't work, uh, I'm not sure um, anything. Um, can oh, yeah, I can see. It. Yes, yes, exactly. I mean, cool. yeah, sure. Great. It's working. All right. All right. So let me see. People are still coming. So I'm just going to also mute myself and wait. So dear all, um, welcome to the webinar. Uh, I think let's let's wait uh, maybe a minute or so, uh, a few more minutes to see uh, more people joining. Uh, actually, we expect some more people to join, uh, but let's see. I sent out the email the other day, reminder, uh, but I think people uh, may take some, some time to basically connect depending on the time zone. Um, I guess it's, uh, uh, I believe it's uh, um, in the US in the morning, uh, it starts 10 a.m. And uh, I'm in a different time zone. Actually, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm supposed to be in Hong Kong time zone, but I'm traveling. So uh, I'm from a different time zone. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you guys also in different uh, places. <clears throat> So uh, I'm not sure who, uh, uh, do you think shall we wait more or uh, uh, we have about 20 people now and um, I think uh, they may be coming 
uh, more, uh, uh, but I'm not sure whether we should. Um, we can we can get started and. Uh, actually, uh, I, yeah, I'm I'm a bit worried about the people who join and uh, um, I don't want to uh, make them wait. Uh, mm. By the way, the session is being recorded. I, I hope this is okay with you, Hook. Um, yeah, that's fine. Um, so, so for those uh, happen to miss earlier part or, or some part, uh, I think they can they can certainly catch up by uh, by watching the recording. Maybe uh, we plan to post it on on, on our website. Um, maybe uh, let's go and uh, and start. Uh, 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 maybe let me introduce first. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, Levant Yobas. Uh, uh, I'm the co-chair of uh, Bio Nanotechnology and Biomass Technical Community under EMB EMBS. And uh, I'm from Hong Kong uh, University of Science and Technology. And uh, this is our second webinar in series. We did the first one uh, some time ago. And uh, this is our second one. And in this uh, webinar, we uh, welcome uh, uh, Professor Hook Lee, uh, uh, a straight professor from uh, Purdue University of Biomedical Engineering. Uh, professor Hook Lee uh, is kind enough to agree to give a talk to share his uh, uh, progress, lab progress, uh, uh, quite interesting. Uh, let me give me a, a brief introduction, and uh, I, uh, I'm sure some of you already know him. Uh, he received his MS and PhD degree in um, biomedical engineering from UCLA. And uh, before joining uh, Purdue University, he worked uh, uh, in San Jude uh, Medical's Implantable Electronic Systems Division. And, and I believe in UCLA, he worked in the area of neuro, neuroengineering and microfabrication under Jack uh, Judy. And um, uh, well, he's, uh, he's gonna share with us his talk uh, today, uh, uh, his, his research activities in Purdue. And he's also a recipient of the NSF Career Award. And he is a, a recently co-founded uh, startup, uh, Rescue Biomedical. Uh, I'm looking forward to hear uh, more about all this uh, from uh, Professor Lee. Uh, without a further ado, let me give the microphone to him. And uh, Professor Lee, uh, please, uh, it's yours. All right, thank you so much, Levant. Uh, thanks uh, for the invitation to share my um, the, the work. It's actually not my work. All the work has been done by the students, as you guys know. Um, so, and thanks to to the IEEE MBS uh, Technical Committee on uh, Bio Nanotechnology and BioMEMS, um, especially um, uh, Professor Thomas Lay and Professor Levant Yobas for. Uh, allowing me to share some of the things that we've been doing. Um, so we, we, as the title um, um, suggests, we work on implantable devices, especially uh, chronically implantable devices. Um, so I'll share some of the latest uh, uh, works um, that we've been working on to improve the reliability of these uh, multifunctional devices. Uh, again, my name is Hugh Lee. I'm an associate professor at uh, Purdue. So since this, this is more, um, oh, there you go. So since the, uh, uh, the the audience I figure is going to be international, and uh, 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 you might not be familiar with where Purdue is. I thought I'd give you a brief introduction of where we are, uh, and then give you a big motivation of why we are doing the things we're doing, and a few examples of how we are trying to create these more reliable devices um, for uh, chronically uh, implantable applications. So uh, here's a map of US. I uh, hope you guys at least know Purdue is located in the United States. Um, typically, uh, sorry, with the laser pointer. Um, typically, people know where California is on the left coast uh, and the west side. And then people know where New York is on the east coast. And then people um, typically know where Texas is down here with um, cowboys and uh, where Florida is, where uh, Disney World is. Uh, but there's a lot of things happening in the middle of the country called the Midwest. Uh, there's a lot of great universities like Illinois, Michigan, and Purdue is uh, happened to be the flagship engineering school in the state of Indiana, uh, very well known 
um, for uh, our Indy 500 racing, uh, but it is also uh, a home to our Purdue University, which is uh, the home of the Boilermakers. We have some beautiful pictures of our engineering quad, the SEAL and the Armstrong Hall, which is named after uh, um, the, the very well-known uh, uh, astronaut Neil Armstrong, uh, first man on the moon. Uh, most recently, I, I know this is not the, the most important things, and but uh, if there are any students listening on this uh, this um, uh, talk and uh, I really care about these kind of things, uh, the latest uh, engineering ranking that uh, we advertise is that we were um, uh, we've been doing pretty well um, in the U.S. News World uh, Reports and the U.S. Uh, engineering ranking. And our program, engineering program, is uh, one of the largest uh, ones in the, in the country. So if you are interested in pursuing engineering degrees, uh, please uh, look into our programs as well. So uh, where I am, which is a biomedical engineering department, is one of the newest department of the Engin College of Engineering. Um, uh, it's been around since, um, I think, about 20, uh, 25 years ago. And it's grown tremendously. Uh, there's a lot of effort, as you can imagine, especially lately with um, the ongoing pandemic, a lot of healthcare issues. Uh, uh, the, the application of engineering uh, uh, of topics for uh, biomedical um, purposes is, has got, grown uh, tremendously. And uh, in fact, this, this building, this is where we are right now. In fact, actually, I'm right talking to you from this window. Um, uh, this we've actually gone to an extension so that we this building is going out to all the way out here now. So we have we are expanding, hiring new faculty, hiring new students, postdocs, and etc. Um, to meet the growing demand of our uh, academic program. Um, Purdue uh, is a, a very well known uh, research university, and uh, we, uh, as such, we invested heavily. Uh, there's a $1 billion 40 acre uh, discovery park, which are, is our um, uh, very um, uh, focused area of interdisciplinary uh, research and translation, um, and crown jewel of which is the Burke Nanotechnology Center uh, that features almost um, uh, 200,000 square feet of research space and about uh, 250,000 square feet of um, clean room access for micro scale and nano scale fabrication. In fact, sometimes it's too nice because they, they won't like us to uh, 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 try new things. As that's the complaints I hear most often from my students is that um, uh, uh, there's a lot of incompatibilities with the ongoing uh, the research um, that are um, super important. Um, so for um, from, from biomedical purposes, we also feature uh, the Center for Implantable Devices, of which I've uh, recently been tapped to lead for, for the next um, um, several years. And also we are home to Purdue Institute for Integrative Neuroscience, where we're trying to uh, improve our neuroengineering capacity. Uh, so with that out of the way, let's briefly talk about, you know, why we are trying to improve the uh, implantable devices. And that's going to be a big theme of my talk. Um, as you probably have heard, uh, and this is not just something that's happening in the US, but people are in general living longer. And if you look at the United States Census, uh, the proportion of people who are living uh, longer uh, is increasing. And there's more people, uh, over, they're expected to be more people over the age of 65 um, than uh, the, uh, the people who are under 18 by uh, around 2030. So people are, uh, are living longer. Uh, of course, they're having health problems, but at the same time, they want to maintain good quality of life. Um, you don't want to just live longer and uh, be sick all the time, right? So uh, a lot of um, efforts are going into maintaining uh, the quality of life, maintaining the functionality of your, uh, of your body parts and health and things like that. And this is not something that um, I think, and you, uh, may have thought about, this is something that has been studied extensively um, in, in the uh, 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 and in this industry as well. So this is actually a little bit outdated now, even though this is from 2019, it's a market research that talks about different areas of healthcare that are expected to grow. Uh, and as you can see from um, the different types uh, listed here, 
these are a lot of advanced devices um, uh, that are required to uh, uh, the address some of the issues that are um, going on in, 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 in the healthcare. And what we are specifically interested in, in are things that has to do with um, the neurological system uh, and to be able to give more integrated monitoring capabilities um, uh, to, to provide some sort of a continuous monitoring, uh, in remote monitoring, uh, wherever you are. This is a, especially more pertinent, uh, this kind of environment where we have um, uh, the ongoing global pandemic that's literally um, limiting access to healthcare in some parts of the world. And of course, there's a lot of these kind of diabetes type chronic illnesses that are happening. And because people are living longer, you have to deal with this kind of chronic illnesses for longer periods of time. So to be able to manage these um, continuous, uh, continuous um, and, and chronic illnesses is going to be a key area of focus for applications. Um, and some of the technology drivers that we identify, there's a lot of um, um, uh, relevant technologies that I think all of us are working on um, from uh, diagnostic devices to uh, wearable devices to implantable devices. Uh, from my group, uh, we focus uh, to specifically on next generation implants that have multiple functionalities, not only to do uh, one or two things, but to be able to give feedback for the clinicians as they uh, remain in the patients, even before the effect of um, any kind of failures or any kind of um, changes in your body system um, um, happens. So rather than having some sort of a reactionary um, healthcare treatment, you can have more prophylactic uh, and, and uh, better chronic management of a lot of these kind of illnesses, which can also lead to a generation of a lot of data uh, and, and big data is a big topic these days, a hot topic that can give um, the analytics and machine learning uh, and provide um, some additional uh, opportunities for better decision making in medical healthcare. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. So, just to be able to kind of um, go over high level what 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 implants are used typically right now, you can think of it as four R's. I know I uh, replace. Uh, I know I only listed three R's here. Uh, they are used to typically replace. Uh, a broken um, parts of your body uh, to restore functionality um, and to repair. Uh, and ultimately what you want to be able to do is to be able to regenerate parts of the body that have um, 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 gone um, uh, uh, um, non-functioning. Um, but for, for the state of the art, a lot of these implants right now, it's not really focused on regeneration, so well, there's a lot, obviously there's a lot of efforts into this, but and replacing, restoring, repairing of different parts of the body that has a lot of um, important um, characteristics. So uh, that's essentially kind of why we are trying to uh, uh, focus on implantable devices because it's a big challenge. And one of the, the biggest challenge, uh, I think, uh, in implantable devices and developing a good implantable devices is that it's, it's difficult to uh, make it more um, invasive and chronically uh, implantable without having some sort of an issue with the reliability. As you can see, you know, you can imagine if you have devices that become more uh, invasive, if the risk of it failing uh, goes higher. So uh, failing of a glove uh, is, is readily um, addressable. You can just put on a new glove, but failing of a, a neural interface uh, in, the, in the body that's been implanted, that's a big deal, right? Because, or any other implantable device, you have to have surgeries to be able to replace it. And that's, there's a lot of opportunity costs associated with that. Um, so, as I mentioned, the reliability of these things are um, uh, uh, sometimes poor. Um, they don't last as long as we want them to, uh, which is for the duration of uh, the patient's lifetime, right? Uh, so there's an opportunity for us to really work on research topics that can improve the reliability of these kind of impl implantable devices. And if you take a look at some of the reasons why the devices fail, um, you can think of it as two main uh, areas. Um, one, the devices just are not engineered properly. So they don't have the enough um, lifetime engineered to them um, so that uh, they, they have um, a material failure or a device system failure. 
or um, the body itself has a natural way of combating against uh, the things that you put in the body. The body doesn't care that you're trying to help it with additional um, replacement parts or sensors or um, uh, catheters and things like that. It just thinks that your, your body is under attack. And it, it tries to protect the rest of your body by, by a triggering inflammatory system, which is another um, um, word for your foreign body response. The, the basically, the idea is that your body, whenever it uh, experiences something foreign to, the, to it, uh, it tries to essentially um, eat it. Uh, but if it cannot eat it, then it tries to form a barrier around it again to protect the rest of your body from the you know, potential uh, pathogen. So a lot of times when you have these kind of sensors and devices that you want to make sure it's functioning for a long period of time, um, and they need access to the rest of your body to measure different kinds of analytes or to be able to access fluids and things like that. Um, these kind of formation of a fibrous capsule that goes around the device uh, actually physically prevents the device from functioning properly for a long period of time. And as you can see, the time scale is such that after a few months, the, the devices uh, do not work very well. And that's kind of um, uh, can be seen very easily if you take a look at some of the state-of-the-art um, biosensor, the most commercially successful implantable biosensors that are um, in the market right now are these continuous glucose monitor. I kind of alluded to the, uh, uh, the need for better management of chronic illnesses. And of course, diabetes is, is one of the biggest challenge in uh, management of um, uh, 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 biggest challenge in chronic um, uh, illness. And these patients, especially type one diabetics, um, typically use this kind of continuous glucose monitor to uh, check their blood glucose levels. Uh, but uh, the problem with these kind of glucose uh, sensors that are um, uh, implantable is that uh, even though they've been around for decades, that their lifetime hasn't really significantly improved very much. And it's not just glucose sensor either. So if you, if you are in a uh, traumatic brain injury situation, a lot of neurosurgeons and trauma uh, um, clinicians actually use this kind of uh, oxygenation monitor to kind of understand how well you're recovering from your uh, uh, traumatic brain injury. Uh, but those kind of um, oxygen sensors that goes into the brain also have very poor limited lifetime. There are, of course, additional um, um, sensing modalities using optical sensing, like you see here uh, in, in, this, in this example, Sensionic, that has better uh, uh, long-term pro uh, properties. But um, the idea is that if there is a way to create sensors that can be in your body uh, for years um, and then can give you the dynamic changes that happens in your body, even before you start showing symptoms of your uh, chronic illness that develops, uh, for example, neurodegeneration or cancer, for example, then uh, there may be a different ways to actually prophylactically, uh, preemptively treat uh, these kind of uh, developing chronic illnesses, even before you um, find out that you um, have cancer or Parkinson's or Alzheimer's disease. So um, let's talk uh, more about how we can address this problem. And this is, there's multiple different ways uh, to address this. And I'm giving you um, a few examples of our approach. Um, our approach is to essentially try to disrupt this inflammation process. Um, as, as, as you saw before earlier, this is how we, uh, the uh, foreign body response actually happens. There is a initially a protein absorption onto the surface of the sensor or, or, or devices. And then there's in, uh, recruitment of immune cells uh, and activation of these kind of immune cells that are mac uh, macrophages and monocytes. And then ultimately it becomes a, uh, uh, a fibrous encapsulation that uh, covers uh, the sensor surface or the device surface to be able to actually prevent any kind of access to the foreign body. Um, so our strategy is to actually disrupt some of these cycles and this process using uh, various active and passive um, approaches. Um, so uh, the, this is 
a multi-pronged approach to be able to integrate sensors with uh, active uh, antibiofouling measures as well as passive antibiofouling measures. The idea is that the passive antibiofouling measures can often delay uh, the, the process of getting protein or cells being attached to the sensor surface and the active mechanism uh, of using mechanical forces or um, electrical and other kind of um, active energy delivery systems can actively remove these kind of biofouling that deposited over time to essentially restore um, the, the sense of surface or the implant um, uh, uh, functionality. So first, let's talk about the, uh, the, our approach of using magnetic actuation to achieve this anti-active uh, antibiofouling. So for those of you who don't know how a magnetic actuation works, it's very simple in concept. And, and, and simplicity is something that you'll see uh, throughout the, uh, the, 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 the conversation I'll have, um, try to make that as simple as possible to um, and, uh, accelerate potential uh, translation. So it's kind of like a compass. When you have a compass and you apply magnetic field, you can change the way it rotates uh, and, and it can do the same thing when you microfabricate um, a, a device with the flexures with magnet on top and you apply magnetic field, you can change the way it deflects out of a uh, plane. And the idea is that we can integrate sensors on top of these kind of surfaces to be able to uh, provide uh, cleaning abilities. So if you think of uh, the sensitivity of the sensor as a function of time, you know, as I mentioned to you, uh, its performance degrades over time because of um, uh, the body's um, uh, resp natural responses. And then when you activate uh, this kind of um, uh, actuation uh, um, mechanism that we can potentially restore uh, the surface by cleaning it and give you that additional um, pristine uh, measurement that you want. Um, so you might be wondering, why did you start making these magnetic actuators? Just where did they come out of nowhere? So this is something that I worked on for a long period of time, uh, as, as far back as when I was grad student, uh, to address this issue with uh, hydrocephalus. Um, um, hydrocephalus is a neurological disorder that is characterized by this large accumulation of uh, fluid that your brain is sitting in. Uh, and the, the, the problem with these kind of um, um, diseases, there's no cure for it, and there's only medical device uh, mediated treatment for it. So these medical devices are basically a series of catheters, uh, like tubes that you put into the brain uh, uh, into where the fluid is at. And then you try to remove the fluid and restore balance of um, the right amount of fluid in the brain. But as you can see here, um, um, it has a very high rate of failure within the first year and over the lifetime of the implant. Um, things like biofouling um, cells and blood clots and things like that gets, go, it gets into the catheter and it physically blocks it. So we wanted to be able to come up with a um, micro device that can be integrated into these kind of catheters to be able to periodically remove it. Uh, the same kind of idea. Um, I won't go into the details of this, but uh, recently one of my grad students actually created this um, uh, self-clearing catheter that we were able to start uh, evaluating in vivo. And the idea is that you can use this kind of magnetic actuation um, that are, um, can be applied remotely, uh, wirelessly, and apply large amount of forces to be able to remove things like blood clots and cells and things like that. And here's some examples of different kinds of biomaterials that can be removed, like cells, proteins, as well as uh, the um, blood clot, um, most recently that uh, we're still trying to get published. Um, but as you can see, before and after actuation, there's a significant reduction in, in throm um, uh, thrombosis around the, uh, the inlet pores of these type of catheters uh, that allows this, uh, the gives you better patency, um, more opening of these kind of um, um, drainage devices. So we're gonna see another video of really significantly large blood clot um, from one of our latest uh, version of the actuators. And then um, uh, just to get a, a slow view motion of um, how these more um, dynamic actuator actually work instead of this kind of uh, torsional ones, uh, we put them on a, um, um, serpentine flexures to get uh, more compliance and be able to uh, uh, actuate uh, for larger um, out-of-plane deflection. 
we were able to do some mechanical evaluation using uh, image tracking uh, to demonstrate which you know frequency that we can use to be able to get the optimum uh, and as, as as big of an uh, deflection as possible. Um, so you can see at different uh, frequency of um, alternating magnetic field, you can see that the device actually differently. So at a low frequency, uh, about 10 hertz, it gives you this kind of large deflection, nonlinear deflection at um, 50 hertz and as well as 100 hertz, you will see the amplitude, amplitude of deflection is going to be limited. All right. So we know how to make the devices. We know how to integrate the devices. Uh, we wanted to next and check and see if we can actually do some, uh, provide some beneficial effect in, in vivo, in animals. So what we have done is we, uh, you know, the, 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 my student uh, created this catheter and helped implant this into uh, the brain of a pig that is suffering from a stroke. Uh, again, we artificially uh, induce stroke so that it experiences a large amount of blood. And of course, blood is very viscous and it can be uh, tough to remove uh, that when it's blocked on the catheter. Um, so what we've done is after you induce the stroke, you implant plant the device, you apply magnetic fields periodically every two weeks and compare the size um, of the, um, the, the, the ventricle, the, um, the, the, the area where the fluid is getting generated um, and the survival uh, rate of the animal over, over time. So here's an image of what the brain looks like um, as a function of time um, when you implant it without any kind of micro devices. So this is basically uh, just regular catheter that you put in to try help drain the, uh, uh, the stroke of blood clot. And you can see uh, it didn't last very long. Uh, after one week, the device actually failed. There you can see a big, large clump of blood clot, pl blood clot in the brain, and this is not supposed to be there compared to uh, our catheter where we were able to periodically actuate, uh, they lasted up to the duration of the um, um, uh, experiment, which is uh, up to six weeks. And you can see the ventricle inside the brain is relatively clear. And there is significant difference in, in terms of amount of ventricle after just one week of implantation. And looking at the survival of the animals, um, about 80% of the, the animals that were treated with our smart catheters survived the entire duration of six weeks. Uh, whereas, you know, all the ones that were implanted with just regular catheter all perished within the first week. So we, we think we show a significant improvement in terms of the way we can potentially treat uh, these kind of stroke um, uh, issues. And, and as you just saw, we can actually make multiple actuator devices to give um, additional fail safe mechanism in case one of the devices gets blocked um, still um, because traditional um, catheters that you put in the, the, the animal uh, into, into humans actually are multipore. So we were able to demonstrate that we can create an array and then still integrate the device. So now that we have had some history of creating this active antibody following mechanism, we also wanted to explore some of these um, passive antibody mechanism using materials and nanotexturing. Um, so I hired a very capable postdoc uh, a couple of years back, and I asked her, tasked her with a, a with a, uh, a job of creating a conductive polymer that we can use to actually create our sensors. And the idea was that we wanted to make sure this polymer that is conductive so we can make it as a sensor uh, also needs to have this kind of zero ionic uh, property uh, that can prevent um, proteins and cells from attaching to it. Uh, and she you know, was very capable and created this kind of um, uh, uh, porous-like um, uh, uh, morphology polymer that is also conductive. And we've done several different testing to demonstrate that these kind of unique polymer can actually um, prevent this uh, protein ad adherence. These are two different types of polymers she created. Uh, not only that, it can prevent um, the attachment of bacteria uh, and also um, some human cortical astrocytes uh, that could be found um, in the body as well. So uh, we're trying to uh, evaluate this in vivo and trying to actually um, double check and see if we can get these to be made into sensors. 
Uh, not only that, we also looked into um, looking at texturing the um, surface of uh, potential sensors um, by using bio, uh, biomimetic surfaces. Um, there's been a lot of different work uh, looking at uh, the, the, the nano texturing uh, of um, um, uh, dragonfly wings and insects and, and, and uh, plant petals uh, that can prevent um, uh, or actively or actually can kill bacteria on the surface from these kind of ordered uh, nano texture surfaces. Uh, so we're trying to mimic similar kind of things on a polymer surface. Um, and what the idea was that if we use a um, uh, very simple oxygen plasma etching on a uh, non planar surface like a tube, uh, will we still be able to induce this kind of um, nano texture surface uh, that can be used as a passive mechanism of uh, uh, um, anti fouling? And sure enough, uh, what we have done is um, we, we were able to texturize these um, uh, PTFE surface, which is a um, highly hydrophobic um, polymer surface that we are um, trying to uh, make it more conductive. Um, uh, the idea was that we were able to uh, make this uh, te te surface be nano textured and then provide this bactericidal properties on a non planar surface, not just a flat surface, but um, get this kind of uniform non texture surface on a large amount of um, area. Um, and as you can see, as a function of different kinds of etching parameters, uh, especially the duration, you can see how much it improves uh, in terms of uh, the amount of bacteria that are attached to this uh, versus in, uh, while increasing the amount of uh, uh, dead bacteria that attaches to this. Not only that, what we have found is that when we implant these um, nanotexture surfaces and coupons, the sample into the, uh, the surface of, um, uh, in, into the, the um, uh, subcutaneous space of, uh, of a rat, we found um, uh, a bunch of different biomarkers that shows less inflammation overall. So uh, by integrating these types of um, nanotexture surface, we believe we can potentially minimize this overall um, uh, inflammatory response that can be uh, detrimental to the survival of this uh, sensor functionality. So finally, uh, on a separate project, we've been working independently to create this uh, biosensors, uh, different types of biosensor. Uh, and we wanted to be able to integrate this kind of 3D printed, um, or basically printable types of biosensors to be able to um, uh, uh, facilitate the integration of active as well as the um, passive um, uh, surface treatments. And uh, printable biosensors are, uh, makes it easy for us to essentially you know, draw your sensing element on whatever surface you can um, um, uh, provide, namely the actuators or these kind of um, uh, hydro hydrophobic surfaces like PTFE. And we've done a lot of work to optimize the process of uh, depositing these sensors and to be able to functionalize it um, separately so that we can um, have individually addressable sensors that have different functionalities. And the idea for these sensors are again, very easy. You just kind of draw this and then you cut it out and then you have a sensor that can be implanted. Um, we have um, history of creating a number of different types of enzymatic as well as non-enzymatic sensors uh, on flexible substrate uh, and more conventional silicon substrate um, and have shown uh, functionality not only in, in, on the bench top, but um, on uh, cell culture, uh, as you can see here, um, measuring glutamate uptake from an astronite, astrocytes uh, in a cell culture, as well as putting them into um, a spinal cord to measure um, glutamate sensitivity to uh, traumatic uh, spinal cord injury, uh, uh, and, and looking at the responses of um, the, the, the optical cortex slice, as well as in vivo to uh, different kind of optogenetically stimulated um, um, cortex. Um, so we were able to demonstrate that these printable sensors can actually be functioning in a bunch of different uh, applications. So now that we've created this, um, um, our um, uh, 
keep capacity to create different kinds of sensing elements, uh, actuation elements, and uh, nano textures surfaces to uh, delay the biofouling. We wanted to, well, what we are working on right now to integrate all the different components to have uh, a self clearing biosensor. There's some very early work um, to uh, create a self clearing biosensor uh, that's been microfabricated. This is a magnetic element, and this is a microfabricated sensing element to give um, uh, uh, to test the the reliability of the sensing elements. These things are still functionalized using our printing technique, but uh, we wanted to see if the sensors still maintain its functionality before and after actuation because it's causing shear around this uh, radius of this paddle. And we also wanted to see um, whether uh, the actuation time can uh, improve uh, the sensitivity again when the device is exposed to um, um, uh, uh, protein solution. So here's this is what uh, um, after it's been exposed to PBS solution for a while, but as you um, actuate the devices, uh, it can um, uh, improve the sensitivity over time. We also tried to create this um, um, uh, polymer, uh, the, the, the zero ionic um, conducted polymer coated biosensor. So after we printed these biosensor, we actually coated this with that bespoke um, conducted polymer that my postdoc created. And then we were able to show that uh, with the um, uh, coating uh, that we were able to maintain a sensitivity uh, uh, against BSA versus without the coating. Um, again, this is all very preliminary results on trying to um, delay uh, and improve the reliability of this kind of implantable sensors, uh, but we think we're on a good tra trajectory to demonstrate that um, uh, ultimately, obviously, in vivo. So switching gears really quickly, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about um, creating a more reliable neural, neural interface, uh, because uh, as you can, you heard even just yesterday we've heard um, uh, about the new neural interface that was able to enable a person a, a locked in patient speak um, for the first time using um, um, uh, this neural interface uh, uh, devices um, and of course there's uh, uh, these neural finesse interfaces I mentioned to you earlier have also different ways to fail. There's a um, uh, uh, biological induced failure um, due to uh, inflammatory response. There's material failing, um, the, the insulation leakage, or there's mechanical failure uh, from you know too much stress or poor um, uh, design of the the device and under usage um, condition. So what we're trying to do is trying to see if we can create these kind of implantable sensors that can go into the body to either to record as well as to stimulate uh, so you can get some functional um, um, recovery back uh, a more reliable. And here's some examples of device failures, a cracking of the installation uh, material on a um, uh, uh, implantable um, tip and there's more examples of how they can either delaminate or fail. Here's an example of, um, a, um, of a lead wire that's actually broken uh, and um, more uh, examples of um, uh, material uh, dissolving away and delaminating from um, the surface that you want. This is also uh, driven um, by the, the desire to have higher density interface, right? So um, especially for certain applications like um, um, optical uh, neural interfaces where you wanna have high density electrodes to be able to stimulate um, very small amount of um, neural substrate underneath to give you a better resolution of vision. So, so uh, a lot of these optical processes, processes have a uh, higher number of channel kinds to counts to be able to give you additional resolution, but that means you have to pack in smaller and smaller amount of electrodes into these kind of um, areas. Same thing for deep brain stimulation as well as spinal cord stimulation. Uh, people are trying to figure out ways to minimize side effects because uh, ultimately you don't want to induce 
um, uh, activation of millimeter scale areas. You want to be able to pinpoint exactly what the neural substrate uh, that is responsible for your, your neurological issues. Um, so there's been a lot of effort to miniaturize and there's been a lot of effort to improve the, um, uh, uh, um, the, the, the uh, efficiency of uh, um, neurostimulation. And, and, and this is not something new that we're trying to do. People have looked at a bunch of different geometries and uh, effects to be able to see uh, what can we do to improve the performance of neurostimulation, reduce the power of consumption so it can last longer. Um, so back in you know, um, 2009, Warren Grill's group looked at different uh, um, geometries with uh, um, uh, the different number of um, per, uh, perimeter to uh, surface area ratio. Uh, but they were able to show that you can see, um, get about you know, 10 to 20% uh, savings in energy consumption by taking advantage of this kind of edge effect. So if we're looking at improving the amount of edge, there's not better way, not much better way than um, in, in incorporating fractals. So uh, what we've done several years back was to evaluate different geometries and see if they have a similar kind of effect, uh, but not in stainless steel, but using uh, platinum, which is more or less um, a well accepted uh, way of doing things. Um, so we designed and fabricated uh, several different um, electrode with same electrode area, but obviously vary the footprint as well as the, um, the, the perimeter length uh, and see if we can get different results. And it goes from the smallest um, perimeter to surface area ratio of this circle to uh, the more um, 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 complex design that are often used for stretchable electrodes. So we had a couple of different ideas in mind. Um, but what we found was that if we were just a, a, a function of um, uh, an edge effect, then you would expect this, uh, the high serpentine electrodes to have the best performance in terms of charge injection capability, uh, but that was not the case. This fractal design, for some reason, uh, had uh, better uh, performance, equivalent performance, uh, as um, the, the high perimeter to surface area ratio one in serpentine. And of course, these one have better uh, performance than just uh, Euclidean circular design. So um, it had um, more perimeter that uh, than the uh, fractal design, but it, the performance was not very significant. We also double checked this uh, in a transient response, uh, looking at charge injection limit. And we saw that the fractal design had uh, almost 70% improvement over the circular electro. So we, we thought that might have be, uh, there might be something there. But uh, we also knew that Platinum actually has a concern of um, uh, dissolving away. Um, and we wanted to look at how these thin film platinums will perform after um, a long period of stimulation. And sure enough, what we found was that uh, after about a week of stimulation, this, uh, this platinum electrode starts to show signs of heavy corrosion, especially at the edges, as you can see here. And same thing for circular electrodes. So we wanted to, know, we wanted to see if there's a way to protect this. And um, we looked around and I got to talk to one of my colleagues here at Purdue, who is an expert in graphene. And, and she told me, well, graphene is used as a diffusion barrier. Um, we can potentially use this as a corrosion prevention layer uh, and see if it can still maintain the functionality that you get. Uh, and sure enough, we created a, uh, um, some samples with um, platinum electrode on top of oxide and coated with graphene and then tested and, and see what kind of uh, dissolution corrosion effect was happening. And as we expected, um, the fractal electrode that has higher edges um, had really significant dissolution from the surface over uh, just 10 hours of um, stimulation, continuous stimulation. Uh, uh, and platinum also had appreciable amount of platinum coming off of it. But once you protected it with graphene, uh, the dissolution was really um, uh, um, minimized. And this is basically translated into this um, uh, um, bar graphs as well. So you can see the significant decrease in the amount of um, uh, dissolution when, when the device is coated with, uh, with graphene layer. 
and we looked into some uh, material properties to see if it really did uh, visualize um, uh, the loss of material. This is non-coded set uh, planum uh, fractal design versus circular design. You can see uh, after stimulation, uh, you start to see this um, oxide layer underneath. Same thing for the circular one. But when the device is coated with uh, graphene, uh, you see uh, very little change and uh, uh, um, uh, color mapping of EDX that we performed. Uh, a long story short, they uh, still maintain a good performance in terms of its transient behavior. Um, and right now, what we're doing, I, I just wanted to kind of skip over that because that was a benchtop testing. And I wanted to show you some uh, preliminary um, um, in vivo uh, evaluation that we are working on. So we created a cuff electrode that can implant uh, in a rat and uh, wanted to see if we can see the difference between fractal electrode and the circular electrode uh, in terms of a stimulation ca capacity because we've only shown that, you know, sure we can in inject more current uh, through the, um, the fractal design, but does that mean anything in, 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 the, uh, in vivo in animals? So we created a, uh, 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 this device to be able to start testing this. Um, again, this is a very preliminary results, but um, we are seeing better activation, um, especially specific subtype of fibers and the, the cuff um, and the uh, vagus nerve um, for fractal electrodes than the circular electrode. We think that maybe we, we have some idea why that might be. Um, and especially we see that at a lower um, uh, limits of the currents, um, the, the, the deviation between the, the activation, um, we see at the lower levels when we inject um, the current. So we think that we have something here uh, with um, a way to protect the micro scale thin film uh, planum electrodes, um, but this is an ongoing uh, work. So um, just to kind of wrap up, um, we work on a lot of implantable devices uh, because the big picture is that a lot of the implantable device reliability is not very good. And these implantable devices have to combat both um, biotic, the, the body's response, as well as you know, uh, good design um, of the engineering parts to prevent failures. And we are uh, integrating microscale as well as nanoscale uh, sensors and actuators to be able to improve the reliability, uh, ultimately to be able to create this kind of um, self-clearing and more reliable uh, implantable sensors and other transducers for um, connected healthcare. Here's my uh, acknowledgments of um, different funding sources, collaborators, and the, most of the work that you, I just presented is done by uh, my first three graduate students, Chi, Hensu, and Tren, all of whom are uh, now at, at bigger and better places. Um, so thank you. And uh, I wanted to um, mention that we are hiring. This is one of our, um, well, it was actually last year, so just during pandemic. So we were just meeting outside um, and uh, that's it. And please uh, feel free to ask questions. Okay, uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, this interesting uh, presentation. Uh, uh, so uh, I think I'm, I'm kind of looking at the audience and uh, please uh, for questions, uh, you can uh, type in the chat window and also, let me see, there is a Q&A &A, uh, uh, &A part, uh, which you can also, uh, which, which you can also type. Uh, there is one here, uh, Hook, uh, uh, maybe I can read. Uh, a great talk, Dr. Lee. I'm wondering whether, I'm wondering when fabricating devices based on PDMS, how would you open the electrode side effectively? Have you tried traditional photolithography on PDM as other than printing. Thank you. Right. So for the insulating um, on a printable sensors, well, basically what we do is we actually draw our insulation around it, or we um, insulate only to a certain level of um, the trace, and we leave the um, electrode part exposed completely. Um, so that's how we um, insulate that using printable. Um, we have not fabricated um, sensors on uh, printing using photolithography. Um, we have only done um, microfabricated sensor uh, recently uh, using SU-8 as insulation, uh, but that was on polyimid. So 
that was not um, uh, on PDMS actually. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, there's another question from Juliana Ricci. Uh, wonderful talk is the study on the conductive anti biofouling coating published. Yes, yes, that, that's, that's been published. Um, I think I cited it here. Um, I think it's an ACS publication. So maybe they can check your website, uh, public right. website. Yeah, it should be. It should to... be on there. That's great. Yeah. Okay. So you can. Uh, you could also check directly the uh, professor Lee's uh, website to access uh, uh, to see the publication, maybe information in more detail. Uh, there's a. Couple of more questions coming. Uh, Prop Hakar, Hakar Sidam Param, uh, great talk and nice approach on graphene coating. What is the power Tesla of the magnetic field applied? Um, so it's actually very low. Um, I think it's in 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 um, uh, in the the orders of um, 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 few milli Teslas. Uh, let me see if I can pull up. The actual, I don't remember the number off the top of my head. I think, um, um, please uh, uh, reach out to me and then we can uh, share uh, the actual uh, numbers. Um, uh, but it's a, it's a very low, low um, the amplitude of the magnetic field that you, you need to be able to actuate is actually quite low. Uh, it's just that um, um, uh, the device is going to be deep in, within the brain and there's distance. So magnetic field dissipates as a function of distance uh, quite rapidly. So that's why you, you use um, quite a bit of um, um, energy at the surface, but um, the, the actual amount of um, um, magnetic field that you need to be able to deflect it is, is actually not very high. Maybe I don't have that um, figure here. Maybe it's in the publication or? That's right. You can check the publication. Just from the same person, just follow up. Uh, just wanted to know, is it MRI compatible? Ah, that's a good question. So we have um, had a, a publication back in uh, 2015 or something that talks about the com compatibility of these devices in um, MRI. So uh, and we've also imaged this in an animal in an MRI, but we have used phantom then to look at the effects of heating, look at the effects of um, um, forces, um, torque and translational force, as well as the image uh, artifacts. And um, as far as uh, we are concerned, we're pretty comfortable um, calling it MRI compatible, compatible but there's a specific um, requirement that you have to meet um, to do that. And, 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 um, and, and we've subjected these things to seven Tesla animal MRI scans and they don't break. Uh, they're super compliant um, and uh, they show a very small increase in temperature because the elements are tiny uh, and uh, um, the artifact can be sizable. Uh, but we can supplement that with CT scans, we, we, we think. Um, uh, and we've also tested this um, uh, over hundreds of millions of cycles of, of actuation, and, and they don't seem to have uh, fatigue um, issues as well. All right, uh, great. Uh, another question from uh, Zafar uh, Takupi. Uh, inserting a sensor in brain, how do you manage to avoid damage to other brain tissues? Uh, 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 that's the first part of the questions, I believe. Um, um, good question. You can't uh, avoid, if you're putting, if you're jabbing things in the brain, you can't um, uh, avoid uh, damaging certain parts. It's, I think it's a collateral damage. Uh, but there are other ways um, to put sensors into uh, the brain, you know, right? I mean, there's the neural interfaces, um, ECOP. Uh, uh, arrays that goes on the surface of the uh, 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 the brain as opposed to being penetrating. There's different levels of invasiveness. Uh, I think we can do that. Our target um, when everything works well is to put it into the CSF to measure metabolites in the CSF. Uh, I think that would be really interesting. Um, that way you're not actually, and then CSF can be accessed not just directly from the brain either. Um, so it can minimize potential damage to the um, actual brain tissue. Um, but there, there, there are different levels of invasiveness um, 
but if you are trying to do this invasively, that's going to be um, like penetrating invasiveness. Uh, that's it's going to come with some um, um, damage. Um, questions keep coming. <laughs> uh, uh, same person, Zafar talk the uh, second part of the question, maybe how effective are the 3D printed products for these applications? Oh, good question. Um, that's a very good question. Yeah, that's, uh, that's gonna be, that's a good question because I don't have an answer for it. Um, uh, the reliability of these uh, 3D printed um, sensors are going to be important to answer. Um, we have not tested that. And uh, I can see why um, they, they wouldn't be as robust as um, more conventionally microfabricated or conventionally fabricated sensors. Um, I think I, I have a few questions also. Uh, this is a quite interesting field uh, to me and time to time I, 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 I kind of uh, keep in touch with the developments. Um, I think one of the issues, especially for uh, these invasive electrodes that goes into really cortex. Uh, one issue is the, is the I think the brain damage due to uh, this micro motion or, um, of the electrodes. Uh, I believe uh, there are uh, uh, the solutions kind of recently uh, proposed for this uh, is something um, dissolvable electrodes. Like you, you it's stiff. You can insert it, but then over time it dissolves uh, in place and then no longer uh, a stiff body stay and, and try to minimize the uh, damage to the tissue. But I wonder, uh, what do you think about, uh, I mean, of course this is uh, related to reliability of such electrodes. Do, have you ever looked into this uh, or, or um, we, about this? Yeah, that's a good question mm -hmm. too. Um, so, so you have to understand uh, my, um, um, my, uh, I guess, scope of knowledge and experience is very limited, so I can't really expand on uh, the merits of some other approach, but I do also use the uh, shuttle um, on the, the implanting into um, the spinal cord for our glutamate sensor that was printed. Um, um, because we printed on a super thin 10 micron thin um, PDMS and it was just too floppy, it wouldn't go in. So, um, uh, so there are some of those transient shuttles, right? Either sugar-based or how, whatever that dissolves away after you put in there and it gives you that floppy floppiness. I think that's a clever way to um, make sure you can actually implant these things in there. Um, there are, there are uh, several different, I think, uh, other approaches um, you know, there, there was that, uh, the in, injectrode, uh, and there's in, injectable uh, electrodes that can basically create like trees and things like that on the, on the polymer based, um, uh, under the, um, uh, those, uh, injectable electronics type of thing. Yeah. Injectable electronics, like, uh, wow. um, conductive nets and things like that. Um, I'm not That's sure what the best way to do that would be, but, um, um, uh, and, and, you know, of course, uh, Elon Musk, they created the little sewing machine to be able to put in um, uh, a large amount of fine fibers into the brain, right? So um, people are working on it. And that, that's going to be another challenge to be able to um, do that. I mean, do you need a um, penetrating one? I'm not sure. I think there's merits for specific type of application. And I'm not even sure whether we need super high channel count for recording either. Um, um, but you know that's the that's the field. Um, so in your lab, pretty much uh, you you more focus on the ECOGs. Uh, uh, no, no, we were doing more mostly peripheral nerve um, interfaces. Oh, peripheral nerve. Uh, peripheral but, nerve interfaces. I mean, yeah. but includes spinal cord. Yes, yes, including spinal cord because we uh, we have some sensors that go into spinal cord and that's penetrating. So, hmm. how about the cough electrodes? I mean, those are quite the. Uh, uh, traditional. Um, it's very traditional and there's not a lot of changes either on that front, um, but it's limited. Uh, existing cuff electrodes are also limited because uh, as you mentioned, um, just like spinal cord injury, spinal cord devices and deep brain devices, commercially available ones, what people use even for, um, um, you know, a lot of research. Um, so, so, you know, I think there's opportunity to 
put more effort into refining that as well, um, which is one of the reasons why we're working in it uh, in, in this area. And you know, a lot of people work on peripheral nerve as well. You know, um, um, Ellis Meng, um, she's very active um, oh, with uh, um, 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 paralleling based devices, right? Um, I used to be, uh, I used to be from uh, Case Western Reserve where they yeah. have this fu functional electrical stimulation. That's right. And uh, they're Dominic quite uh, strong. Yeah, Dominic yeah. Don, right. Yeah. Uh, um, they're quite strong on uh, Absolutely. Uh, peripheral nerve uh, recording Absolutely. or excitation. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's a few more questions. Thank you for the presentation, Dr. Lee. Did you mention in a modeling done for the fractal complex shape electrode design? I would imagine the sharp corners will have more overlapping voltage fields, hitting the heating to target tissue compared to the round electrode. So I think it's a heat induced uh, damage, maybe he's concerned. Uh, Bomb sale Ku is asking. Oh, um, I don't, we've done very, you know, limited simulation using COMSOL, just looking at the um, electric field distribution, uh, but nothing like the heating uh, or anything like that. We are working with a collaborator here um, um, who, can, who can do some, uh, you know, more sophisticated modeling, but I'd be happy to talk offline, um, uh, you know, this, the different um, ideas about you know the mechanism because we are we're very weak on the, the understanding the mechanistic uh, reasons why this is happening. Okay, uh, let me see. Uh, just, um, I think um, uh, uh, Zafar Chakwi, uh, another question. I assume we need certain specific properties of the sensing elements for different pile parameters. Do we have a list of those materials for the specific bioparameter. Yeah, so depending on whatever you're trying to measure, um, your biorecognition element is going to be changed, right? And not only that, you sometimes need basically filters to block out some of these other unwanted uh, metabolites. Um, so for, we do a lot of optimization on, you know, how much of these enzymes you put on there, how thick of um, um, this um, uh, perm selective layer that you want to put on there, as well as designing the, uh, the electrode um, dimensions themselves, right? Um, uh, and there's been a number of great um, um, papers that talks about physics of um, um, construction uh, uh, sensor constructions and its performance, especially related to the uh, the timing uh, the temporal response, uh, because sometimes, especially these neurotransmitter sensors, you want to be able to capture uh, more transient. Um, you know, release of um, the vesicles in the neurons, right? So, um, you know, minimizing the, the thickness while, you know, maintaining some sort of um, uh, functional blockage uh, for non-specific signals, uh, it's very important. So there's been a lot of um, um, effort into that, uh, in that area. And also we are, um, again, with the same uh, collaborator, Ashraf Alam, um, who's, um, who's uh, uh, very well known in this, uh, sensor physics area uh, are, are creating this kind of um, um, maybe a design rule for creating biosensors that can um, uh, predict the performance of the biosensors in various medium um, using uh, electro design as well as the dimensions of, of different constructions uh, material. So um, as well as the diffusive properties and things like that. So we're, we're working on creating more of those kind of universal um, uh, design rules for creating sensors. See. Uh, maybe uh, one uh, question from me again. Uh, uh, on the first, uh, 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 first work you presented on the catheter, you had a magnetic flap uh, uh, I think I was wondering the size of that and the, and the manufacturing of the process. Right. Um, so the device is about a millimeter in size. Maybe it's like 900 microns across, something like that. Um, so this is thin film micro uh, machining. Um, this is polyimid and this is um, uh, nickel that's been electroplated. So basically you, you know, um, you, you spin coat, um, um, polyimid and then you machine it and then you like uh, put seed layer down and electroplate this and then you release it at the end and then so your um, sacrificial layer is 
it's some type of uh, polymer or right the the um, I think I believe uh, my student used oxide as a uh, the release layer um, to be able to to get so the more like, a, more like a HF type of thing that's right you can use um, buffered oxide agent uh, or HF um, to be able to do that I see oh, and then cool. you know this is a very like then um sheets and we just roll it and we you know put, put, plug it into the catheter I see. so uh, this is uh, not a pdms of course right polyimid not pdms uh, this is, po uh, is polyimid uh have you considered using uh, i mean pdms here because you can you can uh, dope the pdms with uh, some magnetic particles uh, that's very true um is there any concern on that on using that way or uh... maybe there's a possibility um, but the the amount of polyimid uh, amount of particles that you will need to be able to get this because right later on the, the these the, these newer devices that we use to remove um, um, uh, blood clots they're actually quite thick they're like in the orders of um, hundreds of microns so uh, in order for us to get that kind of force to be able to remove blood clots. So I don't think you can do that with just in impregnating PDMS with um, uh, magnetic nanoparticles. And also in terms of the, uh, the failure of the PDMS, is it a, uh, is it a long-term material whether you can rely on it? That's right. Uh, that's another issue maybe. That's of course, yep. Okay, uh, let me check one more time. Uh, uh, to the questions, if I believe uh, we pretty much uh, cover all these questions. Again, the audience, uh, um, uh, any questions, uh, further follow up? Uh, uh, how goes the dark? Uh, again, <laughs> we have quite uh, curious people. Uh, uh, asking uh, questions uh, as again, Zafar Takbi asking, how goes the wireless driver work? Wireless driver, um, I don't have a picture of it. It's, oh, I do have a picture of, of something. We, we basically couple um, 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 uh, 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 um, a signal generator with an amplifier to drive a um, just a um, simple, um, electromagnetic coil that we have. And this is basically cooled with water um, so that it you know, prevents overheating. And then we just put it right over the, the head of um, the, the animal to be able to apply the magnetic field. Let's see. Okay, any uh, further questions? I guess uh, uh, um, in terms of time, we are uh, quite a bit now uh, over our uh, so I would say that uh, uh, you are always welcome to contact uh, Professor Lee um, uh, at Purdue University by email. And if you are students who are looking for a positions, of course, uh, as Professor Lee suggested, they have some openings. You can you can approach him. Absolutely. Um, uh, 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 so with that, I think uh, let's uh, give a virtual uh, applause to Professor Lee, thanking him for. Uh, uh, coming and uh, uh, sharing um, his uh, this exciting research with us, and and please uh, uh, do check our uh, website, uh, technical community website, uh, for the recording of the event, and also please do uh, stay uh, follow our website to for the next events basically because we will continue uh, uh, continue to uh, have this uh, series of webinars in in the coming weeks. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, thank you, Professor Lee. Uh, so I'd like to uh, I'd like to thank everybody attending the uh, attending our talk. Uh, and with that, I think I I say goodbye to all. Uh, and hey. and th thank you, Professor Lee. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye.